about to hear from a very distinguished former um, congressperson and uh, a person uh, who uh, is a, at this present status is a spokesperson for um, Albanians in the diaspora, about Albanian Americans here, and ostensibly others as well. Congressman, welcome. Nice to be here, Senator. I recall being here in this very position, facing you on, I guess it was uh, February 1991, just over seven years ago, when you were concerned, really concerned, about what was going to happen in Yugoslavia. And I remember ending that testimony by saying that I didn't think that Yugoslavia was going to stay together. We're all hoping that it would. The United States was banking its foreign policy on it. And all we heard during that meeting was how Albanian terrorists and separatists and the quest for greater Albania was going to destroy Yugoslavia. And now we see what destroyed Yugoslavia, which was there all the time, the quest for greater Serbia. Slobodan Milosevic, when he walked in to Kosovo, in 1987 and brutally occupied it and took away its legitimate status as one of the eight juridical units of the Confederal Republic of Yugoslavia, where Kosovo had an equal vote with Serbia. It rotated every year, created in less than a few years, not only apartheid, but a Warsaw ghetto that still exists in the heart of Europe today. I wouldn't be concerned, Senator, about greater Albania. I'd be concerned that we've already legitimized ethnic cleansing by creating a phony republic called Srpska. It never existed. It's there. Why? Because Slobodan Milosevic wanted it. The person who in the news last Sunday is targeted by his former friend Karacic in a book saying he's about to now go to Hague and he's going to turn state's evidence, and he's pointing the finger at his friend Slobodan Milosevic as the architect of some of the most brutal, unbelievable atrocities since the Nazi era. We don't have to worry about Greater Albania. We have to worry about what I was worried about back in February of 1991. And at that time, I can only wave in front of you a Serbian version of this. I'm now going to give you the English translation. This is what Slobodan Milosevic has been weaned on. Here it is, the expulsion of the Albanians, a paper presented by his mentor, a professor, former minister of the Yugoslav government, Basil Trubilovic, in Belgrade, March 7, 1937. If you want to see what happened in Bosnia, what's happening in Kosovo today, read word for word, line by line, exactly what's going on, their MO, their modus operandi, shelling villages, burning them down getting rid of Albanians at all costs, because this is territory they want. He will not abandon this. And as we keep waffling in this body and in the State Department, he will just go and take more and more and more and more. He bluffed his way right through Bosnia, and he got Srpska. He's bluffing his way right now. He knows that there's no real resolve with this Christmas warning. Mr. Chairman, thank you for this hearing. Sorry to start before you walked in. But he sees and senses the waffling already. He sees strong words on the part of Madeleine Albright. Then Madeleine Albright is muffled by Sandy Berger. And then we have questions coming up in Gilman's hearing a few weeks ago about the Christmas warning and a very lukewarm response by Ambassador Gelbard. We have to meet with you in executive session, and you heard it again today. No direct response. Don't you think Slobodan Milosevic is hearing those responses? Don't you think he's ready to do more and more because he sees that the greatest superpower in the world has lost its resolve, has a foreign policy which has abandoned the principles upon which this country was formed? Our foreign policy should be based on fundamental human rights. That's one of the key determinants of foreign policy. We have today in Kosovo some of the most egregious examples of violations of those human rights. In fact, Senator Biden, during that hearing that you held, and it was a wonderful hearing, it was the first time that you got all groups together to talk about the problem, I had to fly in reports from the Council on Human Rights from Pristina 
and other places, litanies of horror. I don't have to do that today. You know why? All you have to do is read your own U.S. country report from the State Department. Here it is, the 1997 edition. But if you read the last five years, you can't believe the litany of horrors in here against the Albanian people of Kosovo. What are we waiting for? How many people have been killed and brutally, tor brutally tortured and detained and disappeared? Every criteria they use has been violated. Why is there such a disconnect between those egregious violations and our professed adherence to human rights when it comes to foreign policy? Is there another deal in the wind? Perhaps you didn't ask the right questions to Ambassador Gelbard. Are we placating Russia for some reason? They're always there supporting their first cousins, the Serbs. That's where the Serbs came from in the sixth century AD, from the Ukraine. We know they're blood brothers, or at least blood cousins. They're always there supporting them. But what has Russia done for us in Iran, Iraq, and China, and so many other places? They don't support us. Why are we giving such deference to Russia? Why are we even considering a contact group at this point, including Russia? This is an issue that should be led by the United States of America in the NATO milieu, without Russia. This is where it belongs. That is what solved Bosnia. And the only reason today Bosnia is not like Kosovo, Mr. Chairman and Senator, is that we have troops there. Who are we kidding? When are we going to wake up? Another key element of our foreign policy that's been abandoned is that we will do everything to preserve the security of a vital area like the Balkans in Europe. And if you look at international law and how it defines where you uh, have a state of belligerency, you look at what the neighboring countries are saying about what's going on there. Every one of them is using language which is at the edge. Recently, the foreign minister of Greece said Kosovo is like a hand grenade. If it goes any further, it's going to explode. Uh, a Turkish spokesman of the for foreign policy said something similar. I have it right here someplace. Uh, stated that the Kosovo crisis, if unchecked, could destabilize the Balkan region and therefore European security. NATO condemned the excessive use of force by the Yugoslav army in Kosovo and said that the North Atlantic Council is profoundly concerned about the deterioration of the situation there and was considering, quote, possible further means to maintaining stability in view of the risk of escalating the conflict in the region. On April 27th, a spokesman from the United States State Department said that if the contact group members did not agree to a new sanctions package, the United States would act unilaterally. The United States reiterated the UN and the contact group's call for the immediate withdrawal of the special police units, which are nothing more than the Yugoslav army from Kosovo, and the need for unconditional dialogue. And yet, when the contract group met in Rome on April 29th, the United States capitulated to a weak proposal for more sanctions under pressure, especially from Russia, which, as I said before, has gone out of its way not to support us in dealing with Iran, Iraq, China, and many other areas. It is obvious that the sanctions are not really an issue to Belgrade, which has already survived six years of very tough economic sanctions. In the meantime, how many Kosovar Albanians have to be killed? We talk about negotiations. We talk about so many things. No conditions. But when do we get to the point where we say, hey, thousands of Albanians are being killed. Are these negotiations working? Should we now learn from the experience we had in Bosnia that Slobodan Milosevic only understands one thing, and that's the use of force or the threat thereof? In the meantime, they will only serve, these sanctions will only serve to bolster nationalistic fervor on Mr. Milosevic's behalf. Only resolve will work, Mr. Chairman, and that will have to come from the only superpower left in the world, the United States of America, taking the lead with our NATO allies. In conclusion, the two million ethnic Albanians of Kosovo, who comprise more than 90% of the population there, 
have no human, economic, or political rights of any kind. Slobodan Milosevic has illegally and brutally occupied Kosovo now for almost 10 years. I'm not gonna go through the history of Kosovo, but I have a three-page addendum to my testimony, and by the way, I'd like to offer the entire testimony for the record. Uh, I'm giving an abbreviated form of it. Happy to receive it. But when you look at Kosovo, it's not a new story. Kosovo was part of Albania until 1916 and 17, as was that population of Albanians in Macedonia and southeastern Montenegro. That's why they're all contiguous. The line was, if you drew the line around 7 million Albanians today, you have the former state of Albania that came out of Turkish occupation. They're not looking to change those borders. The only one looking to change borders is Slobodan Milosevic. But what they want is some peace in their lives, some self-determination, some ability to raise their families, to be who they want to be, and to save their national identi uh, identity. And what we see right now is ethnic cleansing all over again in Kosovo that we saw at Bosnia. It's time for our State Department to understand that loose talk that brands the victims as terrorists for defending themselves, their families, their property, and I'll even add their sacred honor. It's important to Albanians the way it was important to our founding fathers, Mr. Chairman and Senator. This only serves to give the green light to the real terrorists, Slobodan Milosevic and his henchmen who are massacring innocent people as we sit here speaking. It is time for the United States to stand up for its own principles and demand compliance with international human rights conventions before more Albanians are needlessly slaughtered and a new Balkan war is triggered, this time involving neighboring Albania, Greece, Macedonia, Bulgaria, and Turkey. It is time for Congress to stand up and voice this outrage at a foreign policy in the Balkans that has obviously failed to preserve peace and security in this vital region of the world. It is time for the United States to back up its tough words with concrete actions, such as declaring a no-fly zone in Kosovo, as we did in Bosnia. What is wrong with that? They're using these heavily armed helicopters right now to level villages. Two, ringing Serbia's border with NATO troops and moving an aircraft carrier off the coast of Montenegro. These actions would not only reaffirm our resolve to stop the escalation of the conflict in Kosovo, but I believe would lead to a lasting peace for the Albanian people and all ethnic groups in the Balkans. I would like to also give to the record, uh, Mr. Chairman, a book that I prepared a few years ago called The Agony of Kosovo. It's a um, good reference book. It has three pages of index, uh, index material, because it shows what this body has done uh, since 1987, this body in the House. And it shows that what we're talking about here today is nothing new. It's just escalating. And our foreign policy is nothing new. We're still waffling. What we did in Bosnia, for some reason, we're reluctant to do in Kosovo. And when we talk about the Albanian people as fundamentalists and terrorists, let's not forget what my good friend Ben Gilman did a couple of years ago at the Holocaust Museum in memorializing the Albanian people, the state of Albania, as the only nation in Europe that didn't give one Jew to the Nazis. That's now part of the Yad Vashem in uh, Israel and our museum here. And this book was written by an American Jew to memorialize that fact, and I want to leave you the letter that Ben Gilman sent to um, members of this body in the House to say that. It's a shame that we cannot do something to save these people, these terrorist groups that come from Belgrade, special police that are really criminals let out of jail, and they're given police uniforms and army uniforms, running into homes. They know that the Albanian people save their money, usually with gold. They're going there to get bounty, to get currency. They killed the families on the spot in Drenica. How many women and children were killed in their living rooms and bedrooms? We're still not allowed to go there. There is a mass grave someplace. We have testimony from the women. They heard their men and their husbands and, and young sons screaming. They were taken away, 200. There's a mass grave there someplace. We'll find it sooner or later, as we did in Bosnia. But what are we waiting for? Is this the United States 
that we want to represent, a country that stands on the side as a brutal dictator with state-inspired terrorism, brutalizes a group of two million people who are defenseless today in Kosovo. And what's wrong with a national liberation movement, Senator, when there's no one there to defend you? What's wrong with that? What are they gonna wait for? There are many articles written about when enough is enough. And there was one just recently that I read by a professor from Tufts University. His name is Hurst Honnett. And he said there are two instances in which secession, I'm not saying that, we're, that they're saying that, but even secession, as we did 221 years ago, should be supported by the international community. The first occurs when massive, discriminatory human rights violations approaching the scale of genocide are being perpetrated. If there is no likelihood of a change in the attitude of the central government, or if the majority population supports the repression, as we just saw in that phony referendum that Slobodan Milosevic just held in Serbia, he doesn't want any international intervention, secession may be the only effective remedy for the besieged group. This is international law. A second possible exception might find a right of secession if reasonable demands for local self-government or minority rights have been arbitrarily rejected by a central government, even without accompanying large-scale violence. <clears throat> and it goes on. So this is not an easy issue. It wasn't easy in 1991. It's not easy today. But let's not brand the victims as the terrorists. Let's not talk about greater Albania, because that's not on the table. What's on the table constantly for 50 years, certainly in the last 10, is the quest for greater Serbia. And we seem very willing to give Mr. Milosevic what he wants. I hope we're not gonna do the same in Kosovo as we did in Bosnia. It would be a tragedy of the highest proportions, and I think it would only lead to a very destabilized Balkans and a greater war later on. Thank you.